Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Capley Conversation on Science Communication. Uh, my name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute and the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops. And I'm sorry for all those very long names. Uh, we're all a little giddy here uh, because we just spent uh, an hour and a half, a little more than that, watching an amazing movie about Voyager. And those of you who are tuning in online uh, will now get to hear us talk about it. Uh, the movie's called The Farthest, uh, and it's about the Voyager space probes, but it's really about much more than that. Uh, you can join us, those of you who are watching online, uh, you can participate in the discussion by uh, asking us questions with the hashtag CavliConvo. So please do that. Uh, Dan Rabitsky, uh, one of the SHRP students, will be monitoring the, the Twitter feed and uh, we'll be happy to relay those questions. To our honored guests, uh, we're very grateful to have John and Heidi with us and I'll leave it to uh, Lee to formally introduce them, and instead I will introduce Robert Lee Holtz, uh, our uh, ubiquitous, uh, <laughs> tireless host of the Cavalry Conversations. Oh, and one more very important thing. None of this would have been possible without the support of the Cavalry Foundation and also tonight the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI, and uh, Tangle Bank Studio, which produced this amazing film. So thank you very much to HHMI, to Tangle Bank, and to uh, the Cavalry Foundation. Uh, Robert Lee Holtz is the science writer for the Wall Street Journal. He's also a distinguished uh, writer in residence here at the Carter Institute. And uh, Lee, the uh, podium is yours. Thank you, thank you, Dan, and of course, Welcome. Uh, we're all a little uh, stunned. We've just taken a long, long voyage to the edge of the solar system, but I'm going to drag us all back here to uh, NYU at uh, Cooper Square. This is the first in our fall series of Cavalry Conversations, and our idea, uh, for those of you who have not joined us before, is to bring together a uh, leading uh, researcher and an esteemed uh, journalist to explore how they best bring the general public into the community of discovery. Uh, as Dan uh, noted, these conversations are uh, hosted and sponsored by the uh, Cavalry Foundation, by the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program. And in particular, uh, tonight, we're uh, very grateful to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for sponsoring the screening and making it possible for our two extraordinary guests uh, filmmaker and producer, executive producer of this documentary, uh, John Rubin, and uh, if I may say, uh, uh, world-class uh, planetary astronomer, uh, Heidi Hamill, who those of you here will have noted is both a character and a voice in this documentary. If I may look ahead for just a moment, um, on October 12th, uh, our next uh, session, we'll be exploring the uh, issue of environmental reporting and uh, what I guess we can euphemistically call industrial chicanery, uh, with uh, Sharon Levy from The Intercept and with George Washington University epidemiologist David Michaels, who was formerly the head of the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration. On November 16th, we're gonna be surfing gravitational waves and talking about physics coverage with uh, Natalie Wolchover from uh, Quanta and uh, theoretical physicist blogger and quantum lounge singer, uh, Sabine Holzenfelder from the Frankfurt Institute uh, for Advanced Studies in Germany. And then on November 30th, we'll conclude uh, with uh, uh, another, yes, yet another climate change controversy uh, with uh, doomsayer David Wallace-Wells, who was features editor at New York Magazine and noted climatologist and uh, author Michael Mann from Penn State. Um, our central focus always is how scientists and science journalists can best convey complex research to the general public. You know, most Americans get their science news no more than a couple of times per month. And when they do, most say it's by happenstance rather than intentionally. That's what the Pew Research Center is telling us in a new survey they released today. And interestingly, 
uh, and to the point of our conversation this evening, almost 45% of those people say they get their science news from documentaries or other science video programs, and increasingly through direct contact and direct participation in these events through social media. Well, it's just a fact that planetary exploration invites public attention. I mean, this is how we take solar system selfies. Our evening uh, is devoted to the farthest. A documentary just aired uh, on PBS. It premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, and I believe, correct me please, later this month goes on Netflix. Um, later this year. Later date, this date year. Certain, and another broadcast on PBS, um, November 15th, but I, okay, I won't, I won't stake everything on it that It will reprise mid-November on PBS, and then before the year is out, uh, we'll be able uh, to stream it from Netflix. In any event, um, one way you can look at this, and certainly it's a thread in the documentary, is um, this is arguably one of the greatest outreach projects um, in the history of humankind. And so our two guests here that uh, I want to now introduce to discuss this in this light, documentary filmmaker and executive producer of this documentary, John Rubin, who is with the uh, uh, Tangled Bank Studios, which is kind of the film production arm of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which partners with producers, broadcasters, and distributors around the world. Uh, and actually, in a few short years, it's already produced more than a dozen uh, documentaries on medical and science topics. Uh, John is himself a writer, a director, a producer. He's done, at least to my knowledge, eight segments for National Geographic, uh, at least a half a dozen for uh, PBS uh, Nature. He won an Emmy in 2008. Uh, we are indeed lucky to have him here this evening. And at his side, between us here, is planetary astronomer Heidi B. Uh, Hamill, executive vice president of the Association of Universities uh, for Research in Astronomy which operates uh, a variety of world-class astronomical observatories, including the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, the National Solar Observatory, and the Gemini Observatory. If they, uh, we on Earth have an eye on it, it's uh, likely that that eye is trained through an instrument that this group uh, runs. She's also a key member of the soon-to-be-launched uh, James Webb Space Telescope team. And uh, long ago and far away, she was a member of the imaging science team for the Voyager 2 encounter with the planet Neptune, uh, 19 1989. And she is uh, not just a scientist of considerable renown, but also a science communicator. She's a recipient, among other things, of the Carl Sagan Medal given to a scientist whose communications has greatly enhanced the public's understanding of planetary science. Discover Magazine named her one of the 50 most important women in science. And I may say the main belt asteroid 3530 is named Hamill after her. So that's a long wind up, but let's get to it. So Howard Hughes Medical Institute, medical. I don't associate medical with planetary exploration. What on earth are you folks doing making a movie about this? Right, <laughs> uh, the, the question occurred to us as well, um, <laughs> so we uh, we got a proposal from uh, a, a filmmaker to tell the story of, of Voyager, and something we is not not a topic we'd ever considered. And it's true that our initial films had mostly to do had a foot either in in medicine or, or biology, yeah, evolutionary biology, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then here comes this proposal, kind of puzzling. And then, well, well let's take a look at this. Right? What was the pitch? Um, the, the pitch was the first um, deep feature documentary treatment of, of the Voyager mission, and I knew something about the Voyager missions. We on the, were on the verge of, of dismissing the idea, but started reading it, and hey, that's a pretty good story. Um, and then look at these filmmakers, a, um, a, a Dublin team, um, a uh, director, Ema Reynolds, producer, John Murray, um, and uh, producer Claire Strong, and they're, they're a spectacular team, and the story is irresistible, and then, you know, when we thought about it more, really, the kind of stories we like to tell are great stories about science and scientists, and 
this is a pretty tough to beat story. So all of a sudden we went from a little bit of head scratching to um, when can we start? So, so <laughs> for those of us who might uh, uh, aspire to uh, pitching you one of these days, so uh, on space, <laughs> on space. <laughs> okay, no. So, so for a documentary pitch, this is like a seventy-page shooting script. Uh, um, um, what um, the pitch is uh, about a dozen pages, mm -hmm. and it promises you know the, the first feature treatment rather than TV treatment. So a story told in the voices of the people who made the mission happen, and so it, it had never been done in that mm -hmm. form. It had been done a few times in short TV treatments, but not an artful, long, okay. room to breathe okay. film. So for those of us who, who, who are not um, uh, in the science documentary world, um, the Tangled Bank Studios, I mean, this is the MGM of science filmmaking, it seems. It's only been around since 2012. What, what is the Institute's uh, philanthropic purpose in, in such an enterprise? Well, I guess... HHMI, I just for you who don't know, it funds research. Uh, it's not a, uh, right. in the entertainment business. Right, no, most, most, of, most of what they do is they, they fund research in biomedicine. That's like a big slice of what they do. But part of what they do is science education. And part of science education is speaking to the public about science and, and why there are exciting stories there and why you would, you know, why would you, why do you get excited about that? And so um, there, there is an educational mission and films like this are part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're just gonna have to gather yourself here for a second. <laughs> I wanna ask you a question. So reaching out, so you didn't start as a filmmaker. You're actually, a, a re, a once upon a time, was a, you were a respectable cognitive scientist. Um, at, at least a cognitive what, scientist. Well. <laughs> <laughs> There's no arrest <laughs> record that we're aware of. Um, so what got you to change gears from uh, yeah. doing research it, to reaching out to the public about research? It, it, it was a, a combination of factors. So um, after a number of years in graduate school, um, somehow the, the luster of the work dimmed. <laughs> and it just got less, less exciting. And then a part of it, too, was writing, writing these papers. And I realized that. You'd knock yourself out, you write this paper, 12 people would read it and half of them would hate it. <laughs> so um, I, I just decided I wanted to communicate to a bigger audience and so I was wrapping up, when I was wrapping up my degree, I learned about a very fine fellowship, the AAAS Mass Media Fellowship, which I'm sure some of you um, know about and that's an opportunity to connect a, a new PhD or, or a graduate student with a media mm -hmm. outlet for a summer. And so right after I finished MIT, um, I got this fellowship, was embedded in a film production company around Boston, and there was no looking back. Okay, okay, so you formed a production company. Um, that was your, you know, after, after, well, yes, after, we're, after we're running on fast forward, yeah. so. Um, now I'm curious, I want you to hold that thought for a second. So now I'm curious, Heidi, you, um, of course, our, uh, we have someone on one side of the, of the camera, you're on the other side, you're a character. Um, Is that a good thing? Well, <laughs> you made it look like a good thing. Um, but you are, um, you know, a, a, a very well-regarded uh, astronomer, and, and, uh, you, but you're also a performer here. Yeah. Um, how, how did you get uh, suckered into this? <laughs> well, I didn't get suckered into Voyager. Not into Voyager, <laughs> no, but I mean into this. I uh, was a very respectable scientist at that time, young but, but very respectable. Um, I, I became uh, more of a, a communication-oriented person, uh, scientist, by watching what happened at these Voyager encounters. Um, I was, for the, for the Uranus one, I was just a grad student. I was the kind of one of the kids that went and got coffee for the real scientists. And you know, we got the printouts from the, from the computer and brought them and things like that. But I was watching all the time. You saw, um, those of us who were in the room saw in the movie um, what a big production these things were and how people uh, on the teams were really trying to figure out what the stories were that the, the, the science data was telling us so that they could share it in real time. 
And I just absorbed that. I watched it and I saw how successful it was in communicating to people. Uh, so Storytelling. Storytelling, right. Um, you know, you, I think the, some of the laugh lines were over in, in those uh, videos that we were watching were when people made it real. They, uh, they made stupid jokes about Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. <laughs> Which people, at the time, they, they got that. They understood that. Um, it's how do you communicate? How do you take it from being science to something that anybody who's watching could understand? So I'm curious for a second. So I, I've told that Neil deGrasse Tyson, for instance, has to improve his uh, considerable uh, public skills, actually taken a, a course in stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, did you draw on? Is there like a graduate uh, level course you took in this that uh, teaches you how to be articulate? Yeah, it was my uncle Larry, <laughs> <laughs> who worked in a Mack truck factory. And at Thanksgiving, we would go to my aunt and uncle's house and we'd be watching the football games on TV. And when the commercial came on, he'd turn to me and say, so Heidi, what are you working on? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I knew I couldn't say, well, I'm studying the molecular spectroscopy of the upper atmosphere of Neptune using infrared detectors. Cause he would, you know, it's like, you know, he wouldn't get that. So I, I kind of learned how to translate that. You know, I'm trying to figure out what the planets are made of so that we can understand how chemistry works in an atmosphere. And even that's a little much for my Uncle Larry, but you know, it, it, was, it was sort of how do you use, how do you try not to, to use the jargon that we just, when I talk to my fellow scientists, you know, we, we, you know, if you were listening, you might not even understand it, but how do, you, how do you make it real? And I would have 30 seconds to do it. Well, <laughs> so you learned how to make sound bites. So your uncle aside, I, yes. and I appreciate you're working in the, uh, the technical constraint of the length of the average uh, uh, Super Bowl yeah. beer commercial. That's right. Um, <laughs> it was it's Thanksgiving, so, but Thanksgiving, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. Uh, college Bowl. Um, so in the Voyager team, mm -hmm. as a collective, you have what are, uh, I think in a very real sense, is a, is a, a collection of planetary storytellers. Right. So, John, if I may use you as the surrogate for this documentary team, and I, I realize that you hover above a, a gaggle of other producers and director and screenwriter and director of photography and whatever, but I'm wondering if you can give us a little insight into the process uh, by which, as a documentary team, you sort of sorted through this collection of science storytellers to pick the voices and the faces for this documentary. Right, so I think one thing that made the film a success was, was the exercise of casting. And the production team spoke to and, and considered many people who participated in Voyager and uh, selected a fraction of them that they felt would be good at communicating the stories well and confiding, you know, their emotions about the story. So it was, there was a casting process and some people, some people rose to, <laughs> rose to the list and, and, and were filmed, that, that makes it good. Um, the next step too was, and, and then perhaps you can comment on this, Heidi, mm -hmm. I think the director, uh, Ema Reynolds, did a stupendous job at building relationships with the people in the film. She. Um, gain their trust and when you trust the person who's asking you questions on camera you're more likely to express yourself deeply and maybe you can comment on that but that's that's the one th if I had to name one thing I think is responsible for making the film good it's it's the relationship she built mm -hmm. so, yeah. so Heidi how would I win your trust Take me out to lunch, buy me some wine. <laughs> and is no, that, is that we what, did. Is that we, what that is, did? in fact, what we did. And uh, Claire <laughs> and uh, Emer, um, we, we sat down over lunch, um, and they came to Washington, which is where I work, uh -huh. Washington, D.C. And uh, we went out and we just sat and talked for a couple hours. And I think that's the, what you're talking about trust building. We shared stories. We didn't just talk about Voyager, that was part of what we talked about, but we talked about our kids and our families. and and you know, what they were trying to achieve and um, just, to, just try to get to know the other individuals as people, try to figure out what it is they want to do. 
And, uh, and I think that helps a lot to open people up a little bit. Do you want to be opened up? I think it's very important that people see scientists as well-rounded individuals. I think that, um, that the media industry uh, has a lot to answer for in some of the stereotypes that we have about science and scientists. And a lot of that is perpetuated by scientists themselves. I, I will freely admit that. Um, but we, we don't often get well-rounded portrayals of what scientists truly are like. Um, you know, we get the Big Bang Theory, right? I remember when that came on and my kids were like, Mom, you have to watch this show. And I'm like, I don't need to watch that show. I lived that show at <laughs> MIT. <laughs> I met Sheldon in the basement of the MIT library. You know, I, I don't need, uh, you know. And it, Did I, we meet each other? No, we, different though. <laughs> we might have, I don't know. Um, but, you know, to me, like, uh, you know, I get the humor now and I watch it with my mom, my kids, and we laugh and it's funny and everything. But, but boy, does it perpetuate some stereotypes, really, about how scientists are. So, so when someone like John or the documentary uh, crew approaches you or a reporter, science journalist approaches you, you, you feel a special obligation to be non-stereotypical. Well, I just try to be myself. And if that's iconoclastic and that's what some people have said about me, then yeah. so be it. Uh -huh. So there's a sorting process though, John, that, that you and your team go through. Um, I don't know, maybe Heidi, you know exactly how many uh, scientists and engineers were involved in the uh, core Voyager team, but surely it was in the hundreds. Oh yeah, o uh, over the many, uh, many years. Yeah, yeah, some of whom, well let's just say some of whom are articulate, but some of whom are also maybe stereotypical. Um, you sort these people, I noticed a number of your more articulate uh, characters in this documentary weren't involved in the mission at all. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, good example. Um, I think, uh, who I, was, I, I for think those of you, was the really well-spoken guy with the really thick black glasses who... Uh, right, uh, and, but he, he was an outlier in the sense, I think he's the only non-mission person, he, even Jim Bell, Jim Bell wrote a book about the mission, right. but, but he, as a student, was on the mission, wasn't he? Yeah, well, we, he was one of the grad students with me at the Voyager flyby, right. and we got coffee together for the scientists. <laughs> okay. uh, but then he was there, as I was, as full-fledged team members for the Neptune encounter. Right, right. So, so there was only one, one non-mission person. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting, the original vision of the film on paper was to include many more voices, uh, commentators at large. Um, you know, for example, it was con considered people like J.J. Abrams, people who would have uh, you know, perhaps a perspective on the cultural significance mm -hmm. of, of space. And, and that idea, I guess, in, in, in the hands of the producer and director, fell by the wayside, I think, in, in part because the mission people they got to know and interviewed were so great <laughs> and, and told the story so well. So some of you got the screen test, <laughs> and some of you didn't. You know, it was interesting to see the late Carl Sagan Mm -hmm. uh, in so much footage, and of course, uh, there is famously in, in the realms of science the Carl Sagan effect, which is to be, uh, if you're a serious researcher, to be uh, somewhat scorned uh, and criticized for, uh, if not shunned, for, for speaking articulately and well to the camera. Uh, I know that you have uh, uh, given, I can't even think of how many different, how many hundreds of interviews uh, how many uh, dozens and dozens of film clips you've uh, sat for to talk about various phenomena over the years. Do you think uh, your colleagues are uh, uh, snickering behind your back? Do you think they don't like you for your ability to do this? I think some don't. Some feel resentful. They, they say, why are they interviewing you? I'm the expert in X, Y, Z. And, uh, you know, I, what, what can you do? I, I, I feel I still... I think it's important that we get out there and talk. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody has the ability to be articulate, to form thoughts in a coherent manner, to learn how to end a sentence. <laughs> I should tell you that journalists have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and that is the one piece of direction I most often give when people are asking, how is this interview going to go? Figure out your ending <laughs> is the most important, yeah. that's the starting point. Yeah. Yeah. 
where you headed. Both for the interviewer and for the interviewee, where he or she would like this interview to end. I'm, I'm curious, and I want to hold just for a second, I want to remind people that this is uh, uh, not just a conversation between us, but uh, we invite you to uh, join us with your questions, both those of you who are watching us online through Twitter, uh, uh, but also uh, those of you here, there's a mic right over there, um, if you want to uh, ask a question or challenge one of us for something silly we've just said, um, please take the advantage of that and, uh, and uh, let us hear you. Um, so I'm curious now, uh, how many people, we talked about how large the Voyager imaging team, the team who's making the doc their own documentary about the solar system, how large is the documentary team that's making the documentary about the people who are making the documentary <laughs> about the solar system. Um, so it, it is actually a pretty small team. This is not a Hollywood-sized team. It's, it's a it's, it's a lean team. It's um, in the field shooting. It would be a cinematographer, a camera assistant, a director. Um, uh, not, not the producer wasn't the co-producer was there. You know. Like that's about it. A half about dozen people, at less. Time. Like I, I just counted four. Mm -hmm. That's about right in the mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, back mm -hmm. um, later, there there's mm -hmm. an animator, a composer. But it's it's a lean documentary team. Mm -hmm. But how come on the credits for the film there was lots and lots Thank and lots you. of Thank names? Thank you very much. Who are all those people? Um, well, well, it's that mysterious uh, category of special thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but surely there were sixty or seventy people there. Well, mm -hmm. well so. Um, you know, let's let's see. A lot of them were special thanks. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were song credits, um, ah, okay. mm -hmm. right? But you know, actual mm -hmm. hands-on people, mm -hmm. um, not that big. Mm -hmm. So the team is small. What's the budget for something like this? Um, so it's just um, not supposed to throw around those numbers, but I bet you could find it out there by Googling well, I mean, it. Let me rephrase the question. I don't want you to give away yeah. any of the secrets. Trade secrets. <laughs> of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Tangled Bank Studios, but can you give us a ballpark of sort of, uh, in a broad term, the kind of financial commitment, this sort of thing, in a general way, <laughs> uh, represents? Um, Even orders of magnitude? Yes, yeah, well, um, <laughs> um, G, 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 I, I like that. Uh, sure, you know, um, you know, over 10 to the 6th and less than 10 to the 7th. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it's also you have to take into account it's not just the production of the film. There, um, there is promotion, mm -hmm. um, uh, screen, you know, outreach, screenings um, um, for the feature version of the film. Mm -hmm. We have made ourselves uh, Oscar eligible. Um, so How do you do that? Um, um, it's very technical. You have to rent a theater in Los Angeles and a theater in New York and screen the film for seven days. It's that specific? <laughs> Um, it's even more specific. Um, there have to be four screenings a day, some of them spanning certain hours. <laughs> and you have to advertise them with like ads that are at least that big. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry, <laughs> you've stunned me. No, no. And, um, and, 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 and even, even stranger is the number of films um, that have qualified for this, the, the next round of Oscars to date, that I think the calendar is still open. 270 feature documentaries. 270 feature There's a feature lot a lot of effort and striving out there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Scary. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's actually inspiring. kind of in inspiring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do I, do I uh, uh, see a question hovering in the darkness <laughs> there? Two questions. Two questions. Well, ask the first. I'm good then because we'll see I don't we have think. the second. <laughs> She's got the second. So I was wondering, Voyager is, of course, a very long mission. In fact, it's uh, sort of endlessly long, but so far it's, it's been a few decades. And I was wondering how you picked the stories that you wanted to include mm. in the documentary and how you figured out how to partition the time to give each story uh, what it, it needed to get the emotion mm. and the feeling across. 
Right. Um, so uh, the filmmakers, in advance, right, in, in their proposal, they had identified the, uh, the parts of the story they were most interested in. So right from the start, they knew they were interested in the moments of peril of the mission, and that helped, that's part of a good story. I mean, Voyager almost didn't make it in a number of ways. You know, both of them at launch, one of them past Saturn, as, the, as you just saw in the film. So they, they knew the key dramatic moments. Um, they knew that the uh, Carl Sagan's pale blue dot was an important story. They knew that the record was something that everyone connected to. As one of the bites in the film said, um, you know, the, the notion of communicating with an alien intelligence is far more riveting than the, the chemical makeup of a mineral, right? So that the record was central to the story. And, and on, on paper, the filmmakers knew from the start they were going to go back and forth between the mission of, of the spacecraft working their way out the solar system and stories about the golden records. So th they, had, they had a good sketch of, of what the rhythms of the film were and the key components. I but really at the same, well, I just wanna, I just wanna add please. something. I, but at the same time, I think a lot of what they brought into that film, one of the reasons it was so entertaining was that there were a lot of spontaneous moments that where, where the scientists or engineers were relating little stories that they had no idea were coming. Um, I, I, I agree with that. And if, if as a filmmaker you go into um, a, a film or an interview overly prepared and you're just kind of, you know, okay, check, got that, got that, yeah. it's not going to be good. You right. have to open yourself up to yeah. the crazy stuff that comes. Yeah. I know they were very surprised when I told them I had all my log books from Voyager and all the drawings and the sketches, those are my drawings and pictures and arrows and wows and exclamation <laughs> marks. And, um, they, they had no idea those things even existed and so I brought some to the lunch just to show them. You know, this is the kind of uh, excitement that we were feeling and I, this is how I was capturing it in real time. And right, so, yeah. Yeah, so on, ongoing, ongoing discovery, yes, you have yeah. to be discovering stuff uh, while you're making a film until you, know, you, sh you shut it down. To, to just take his question a little deep, uh, it seems to me that, that one of the things that, that uh, he was asking was how, how do you decide that this is an adventure story and not a science education film? You know, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that Pew Research uh, Center study noted that um, the, the slice of the American public uh, that they sampled um, believe that science documentaries, for instance, are much more accurate than most uh, science news reports they get in the general media. Now, there are probably a lot of reasons for that, but one of them may be that there's not as much science in that um, uh, as there might be. Um, in, in this film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, you don't so slow down and explain, like, the... Uh, no. Helium no, hydrogen no, balance no, in no, Saturn's atmosphere because um, there might be someone out there who finds that interesting. Um, I mean. That's true, and nor, you know, nor do we explain how gravity assist works. And and really, and Good when point. you start to think about it, it's it's actually more complicated than you think. Like, you know, as you go past a, a planet, why doesn't it suck the same energy out as it puts in? You know, that's not that easy, okay. and we don't go there in this film. So, uh, um, yeah, th this film is you you could almost call it in the genre of exploration more mm -hmm. than science. Um, and that's fine, right? I think it's fine. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> suggesting it's not fine, but yeah. I'm suggesting it's a decision. Oh, yeah. um, it, 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 it is a decision. And uh, of course, one of the, you know, one of the, so you mentioned like a, an, an educational film. There's a genre difference mm -hmm. here, right? So in, in a narrative documentary, uh, the heuristic is that when information comes out, that information ideally should be tied to you know, the hopes, dreams, aspirations, mm -hmm. reactions, emotional life of a character in the film. So that's, that's a narrative documentary. In an educational film, a, a completely separate genre, information can come out anytime in any way. It, it doesn't need a wrapping. It's about the information. And, and, and yeah, so the way I think about when I'm doing an interview in my own films, what I think ab about, I think an interview is, I, I don't even try to get people to give me 
information per se. I try to get them to react to information and interpret information. Please. So two questions. First, um, for Heidi, it's really wonderful to see um, your work sort of played out in these animations. It's really, really exciting to see um, the detail of that. I wonder if this is slightly off topic, but I still think really important and I really would love to know. Um, how do you, how have you managed um, running your family and all of these incredible things that um, you've done that was mentioned in your intro? Um, also, I'm a huge fan of your work with Hubble. And, I'm, and if you can just touch really briefly on what's happening with James Webb, that would be really <laughs> cool. And, um, <laughs> and also for John, would you consider um, what's next for you and would you consider a film on James Webb or are you, are you going to continue this theme uh, going uh, forward? Uh, Sorry, I know that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, that first question is like how your whole life. So yeah. that was a really <laughs> rough one. How did you do it all? How did you do it all? Um, yeah, you just, you just do it day by day, hour by hour. Sometimes it's moment by moment. Uh, you just, I have three children, so balancing all of, you know, a scientific career with, with three kids and, and making all that happen, you just, you just do it. You just, it's just like any other job. You treat it like a job. It's just, sometimes it's an amazing job because it's space. Uh, but, you know, it's every day you get up, you go to work. You know, some days you sleep all day and you work at night because you're at a telescope. Uh -huh. You know, you just make that all happen. Uh, that's a whole other conversation we could have. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, I'm very excited about that. You know, we're, we're kind of closing in on launch. Um, I view that as another one of my children. I started working on that project oh, 17, 18 yeah. years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, you started uh, someone who was talking, it was actually the question, you started talking about the long time scales. I thought you might go in a different direction. Um, I wanted to make clear that when, when they were conceiving Voyager, I was just a little child. I was only, you know, a kid. I was still in high school when it launched. And so, uh, you know, and I was, in, in, as a, I was an undergraduate when we flew by Saturn, and then by the time we got to Neptune, I was on the team. So these are, these are generational missions, and so is James Webb Space Telescope. And so are all the major missions that, that we do to explore. And so when, I, when I'm communicating, it's not that I want necessarily you to know what we're doing. I maybe want the kids to know what I'm doing. <laughs> because um, the, the young woman who was my deputy for the solar system observations with James Webb Space Telescope, I did some math recently, and when I was writing my proposal to become a scientist for James Webb, she was still in high school. Okay, so um, that, 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 that is knowing that I have to be talking to, 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 to you, so you will talk to your children <laughs> or your grandchildren. Um, I, that's what we need to do to build a culture of people who care about science and who care about exploration. Not necessarily about space, but exploration of the human genome or exploration of cancer or exploration of batteries, uh, capacitors. Uh, you know, that the, we do it so that we can build this body of knowledge. And I'm sorry, I got a little winded there and I'm trying to find my ending <laughs> to, to wrap this up. No, it, so. was, it, was, it was very good and I also, you gave us all an opportunity to see how you do this. <laughs> okay. And you had, wait, oh, he had a, he had oh, a question. John, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, so, please, um, yes. uh, so the, the question was, um, it, you know, is there more space in our future? So just personally, I w I was been interested, deeply interested in space since I was a kid and even like wrangle the neighborhood kids when I was growing up and guided them on these kind of, you know, fantasy trips through the solar system, and I have no idea why they put up with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't, I hardly knew anything, but I guess I knew more than they did. Um, um, so are, are we going to be doing more with space? Well, certainly we'll, we'll be doing things around the Voyager film to um, uh, um, out, outreach efforts and, and uh, you know, classroom educational um, materials, but whether there's another big space project for us, um, not, not clear yet. You don't, I should tell you, you don't have to do that. You don't have to turn. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, okay. <laughs> okay, no. Because they vanish back into the crowd, so yes. you can talk to us and not hurt your neck. I just okay, because that please. Um, hi. Uh, so you mentioned that you did some screen tests for individuals in this. Um, and as I'm sure you know, some of your coworkers have a lot of character. Um, and uh, I've just kind of noticed generally, not just with this documentary, um, but with, I mean, anything. In like Cassini's press release recently, there's a real like romanticism to it. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious if you think that is, comes out of, if that is something that you kind of have to have to do this kind of work, if this comes out of a lot of time alone with computers, <laughs> if this comes out of like, <laughs> needing to like bill what you do to the public. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious where that you think mm. it comes from. I think uh, those of us who devote our lives to planetary exploration or any kind of a science enterprise, um, we don't, we do it because we're passionate about it. And, and because you have to be, I mean, you have to go to school forever <laughs> to get a PhD in a science field or an engineering field. Um, you have to really want to do it. Um, and so I think that every, almost all of my colleagues are deeply passionate about what they do. I think um, a lot of them have bought into this uh, ethos that as a scientist you shouldn't show that. Do you remember in the movie, those of you who saw it, there was one point where Brad Smith, the head of the imaging team, was standing at a podium and he was standing there, you know, it was like almost no expression, saying, this is the most exciting moment of my entire right. life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and it was, uh, you know, but you know, for me, when I'm up there, like when uh, we, we talked a little, bit, um, a, a little bit beforehand about the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet crashing into Jupiter, and when that happened, it was the most exciting moment of my life. And I'm like, this is the most exciting moment of my life. You know, I'm just like, I'm not afraid to say it because what are they gonna do? Are they gonna take away my PhD? You know, I, I don't think so. Um, but you know, tr this is truly what I'm feeling. And I know, I know that that's what Brad was feeling too. His heart in his chest was going ka-thump, 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 ka ka but, but he was like, this is the most exciting. <laughs> So, so I feel that part of, part, of, um, part of the reason that I have been asked to do a lot of this is because I don't, I'm not afraid to show the feelings that we have. And I think that we are trying, I know when I say we, a lot of the people I know who work in science communication, we are trying to change that culture. We're trying to make it allowable to say, this is truly exciting, what we do. It isn't dry. It isn't, it isn't um, I'm sitting in a room by myself thinking. You know, it's like we're working in teams of people together. We're exciting mm -hmm. each other. We're learning. Uh, we're just trying to make it uh, real. We're trying to show what we're feeling. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's I'm trying to make it real. So when you're picking characters then uh, for the documentary, um, is it that quality that you're looking for? Uh, Ab absolutely. You want someone who has a, an, an emotional relationship with what they've done. And you want someone who evinces excitement. I mean, why would you do all this hard work if it wasn't exciting? Um, and why would anyone <laughs> want to watch a, you know, watch, watch a film where somebody is giving you just the facts, right? It's, it's, a, it's a human experience and it's driven by emotion and uh, you know, we try to find people who evince that. Like I, I don't know if you can quantify this as a filmmaker, but some of those moments that you gave us in this documentary, your team, um, I mean, they were extraordinarily succinct little lozenges of like very pure sort of joy or melancholy. I mean, how many hours of interviews does it take to get that, you know, the little misting over or the, the funny little smile or the, the, the thing that you're... Right, well, and, and again, as, as I said, before the interviews, it's who are you going to interview? And then you do the interviews and work them down into a story, but like, you know, I, I, 
you know, how, how much interview, well, how, how much material did we have? Uh, uh, it's an immense amount of material that has been winnowed into the film. We've just seen, uh, it's, you know, to be nerdy, it's 14 terabytes of, 14 terabytes, <laughs> terabytes of, of video material. Yeah, so, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of funneling and a lot of choice. I can put it in my own perspective. I think I was interviewed like for a day, like, you know, six to eight hours of interview, and then my total amount of screen time, if you added up all the little snippets and voiceovers where I wasn't shown was maybe three minutes, mm -hmm. uh, six hours. And that was just one of you saw many, many people that were interviewed. Yeah, 20 some in the film. Yeah. I just want to say congratulations to both of you, John and Heidi. I have, I am a science journalist. I've been a science documentary producer, and I've sat behind the camera making scientists sit there for six to eight hours. Um, I do appreciate all the effort that you both put into it. And uh, I went into science journalism because it's so visual. I love your poster. Um, I was reminded, I don't think I've ever seen a science documentary before where the press was a character. And the scientists were actually commenting on, oh, the press got that, they liked that. Um, I was reminded of something that I think Lawrence Krauss once said to me, which is that journalists and scientists are both trying to tell stories. And I wondered if that resonated with you, if, you had any com if either of you had any comments. Thank you. Well, I think storytelling is just where journalists and, and documentaries start. That's, you know that's what you're, you're doing from, from the outset. Um, and I think, as you started to say, it, it comes more naturally to some scientists than, than, than to others. I mean, there's a big, there's a big range. Mm, yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree that it's about the storytelling. I think every... Every talk that I give, I try to craft it as a story, an arc from a beginning, a middle, an end. You know, I want to take people on a journey with me. And so, you know, I don't want to just sit there and show facts and, and, and show pictures or show spectra or whatever it is I'm talking about. Um, I think it's important that you tell the story of why you're doing something and how it happened and where it ended. And uh, I think that's what makes it so powerful. I think your point about the, the engagement of the scientists and the journalists was a really good one, and it is something that often gets missed. Um, I can tell you that having grown of age through the planetary exploration program, the journalists who covered planetary science, they were part of our family. I don't know Jonathan Eberhardt, mm. what a character he was, and he was part of our team, and you know, we would all, we played music together, you know, he was a musician, and so were many of us, and so, you know, and, and Ron Cowan, I got to know mm. Ron when, when Jonathan was on his way out, and, and, and so we developed a lot of rapport with the, science, with the, with the community of journalists, um, and science communicators who worked with our community. I think that, I think you saw that in, in, this, in the movie, um, that there was that rapport. And it's a little harder now today. I think um, it was easier when our science was happening as events like this, like you saw um, with Voyager. Um, Nowadays, with social media, and, and, and things, people are more, are more distributed. It's harder to get those relationships and, the, and the, mm. the people experiences. So those of us who have those relationships, I think maybe that's one reason we get tapped a little more. It's like, oh, I've talked to Heidi. I know she can give me a story. Even though it's not her field, she at least like, like someone was saying, was somebody was, you were saying, you know, I, I, I don't know much about this, but I know more than the other people. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, and and I'll, I'll just add one thing about uh, the press being a character in this film. I, I think that was a kind of a, a, a true evocation of the fact that the eyes of the world were on this mission. This mm -hmm. mission was a big deal. The, the world was watching mm -hmm. as we did this. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how it feels, you know, how was it now compared to then? It's hard to get that amount of focus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, that, that's a pretty high mark set then. It is, yeah. Well, I, I feel obliged to sort of 
if I may join. Um, so I first met you um, during the 1994 um, encounter with Shoemaker Levy, uh, for those of you who weren't around in 1994. Um, this was a moment for the first time uh, humankind was able to actually watch a comet slam into another planet. And the planet in the case being Jupiter, the comet being a string of things that had broken up seven of them, I believe. And, 21. Uh, 21, sorry, thank you very much. Well, this is why we need sources. Um, and in 1994, this was really before the World Wide Web. Uh, uh, cable was kind of like the high communications technology of the day. And uh, NASA did what was kind of like the proto-inclusive thing, which is uh, they set up a video monitor, gathered the various planetary astronomers around it, and as the first images of Jupiter, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, I believe, um, were put up on the screen, and these astronomers were themselves seeing them for the first time as these collisions happened, and no one had any idea what to expect. Um, you, as the public, got to see the expressions on their faces as these things popped up. And it was a, uh, an amazing moment because you saw these very sort of staid and uh, emotionally constipated people suddenly, <laughs> you know, throwing their hands in the air and gasping and grabbing their cheeks and crying and laughing. And of course, what they were seeing was this poor planet Jupiter being pummeled by more megatonnage than all of the nuclear arsenals on planet Earth. Um, a, a truly explosive moment. Um, so hot was this moment that 45,000 people logged into the servers uh, that were the, uh, sharing these images and crashed the servers. 45,000 people. Last, last Friday, I was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for the end of the NASA's Cassini mission uh, at Saturn. Uh, NASA told me uh, earlier today that all of their various social media uh, tweet involvement, downloads, uh, face tube hits, uh, 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 you, you know, you, you stream. Uh, 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 <laughs> it added up to uh, eight billion non-unique visits, and NASA is the first to tell you that that's more than there are people on the planet at the moment. So, forty-five thousand in 1994, eight billion today. That's the measure of participation, mm -hmm. I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. people want to be involved, and we, we try to, you know, one of the things that uh, we, we learned with Shoemaker Levy 9, as you said, it was sort of the dawn of the internet in 1994, and uh, we had a lot of debate at that, how we were going to interact with the journalistic community. Um, uh, the uh, events like like what you saw for for Voyager, um, you know, JPL did that kind of thing. But this was on the other side of the country, and it was Space Telescope, and they they didn't do event. It's just not a thing. Astronomers didn't do that kind of thing. You know, we planetary scientists did, but the astronomers were like, no, 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 no. And uh, I'm like, no, no, no. It, you know, we have to be ready. Uh, this there's this thing called the internet now. And people are going to want to know, like, what our pictures look like. You know, we should be putting them online right away. And, and the astronomers are like, no, 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 we don't, we don't, we have to analyze the data. I'm like, so that's just, it has to be real. It's it's going to be a real time event. The astronomers didn't have an, a Voyager like experience. They they hadn't sat there in that room filled with journalists who were sitting there. You know, well now they do this, but back then they were writing. You know, in real time, and then they would call on the phone and. Um, I knew because I had sat there through two Voyager encounters. So I knew that if this event, Shoemaker Levy 9 hitting Jupiter, turned out to be a big event, there would be a huge demand for contact with the scientists. And um, I actually honestly didn't think there was going to be anything to see. <laughs> Uh, yeah. A lot of people didn't think there was going to be anything to um, I had been interviewed uh, by the BBC the night before it started. Uh -huh. It took a week. These, there were so many fragments. They were strung out. The planet was spinning. And it took a week for all these fragments to hit. And the night before it started, yeah. the BBC interviewed me and said, what do you think is going to happen? I'm like, oh, well, you know, 
we're gonna look, but you know, honestly, maybe, maybe a teeny, teeny little white spot, a little white cloud, right? And then the next night, you know, when we were down there, and it was in the basement of Space Telescope Science Institute, and this on the screen we could see the image. It's like this huge black splotch on Jupiter. I'm like, you know, oh my, you know, it's like it was, it was just like unbelievable. And um, you know, I. I I'd, I'd been in, I knew how the press wanted to hear about this. And there was actually, at the time, there was a press conference happening upstairs. They had Gene Shoemaker and Carolyn Shoemaker and David Levy, and they were sitting there with the whole ca uh, auditorium filled with journalists. And, and they were saying, uh, we, we had it on our little monitor. We could see it. We could see them saying, well, we're really not sure if anything. And we're in the basement with these wow. pictures, with this big black splotch on it. And I'm like, we have to go break in. And, and all the NASA people are like, oh no, we can't do that. They're running a press conference. I'm like, no, 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 we're, gonna, we're going up. And so I said, we're going up. And they're all the guys with and their- And we're taking them down. <laughs> <laughs> the guys with the cameras, like you said NASA had cameras set up. They were so nice, they're all set up. And I'm like, we're going up. And they're like, ha ah, ha, they're falling. Yeah. And we broke into the press conference. Yeah, it was extraordinary. We broke in, you know? Yeah. All I had was like a thermal paper printout, you know? I got, I, I couldn't let them, it was a moment. I couldn't let the moment go. We had to break in. And it made, I mean, everybody was on the, and then everybody was on the story with us. That's, that's the story. You bring them, everyone along on the journey. It isn't, isn't the scientists doing neuroscience thing. Hey, we're all on this adventure, and none of us know what's going to happen for the next week. Come along for the ride. That was, that was what it was all about. Sorry. <laughs> you could tell I had a good time in 1994. That's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So I don't have a filmmaking question or a science question as much as a what happened question. And uh, I think the answer will pertain to journalists and government scientists today. Um, what was the, the story that was told in the film that Jefferson blew it so Nixon agreed to two planets? Uh, I'm curious because it sounds like the scientists just kind of decided to go to all of them anyway. And I'm not sure if it came up in research, how that came to be, how they, uh, not only made that decision, but then pulled it off. Um, and I'm hoping to find an answer. So we, we can split this, because I bet you know more <laughs> than I do. But I, I know that um, they just very quietly um, avoided making any decisions that would cut off the chance to go beyond Saturn, to get to Uranus. And, and, they, had also, and they also, had, there are positive changes, but they were very cheap, for example, the, uh, the the star tracker, the um, uh, the, the, the navigating, what, what is the star that is the beacon that you zero in on to get your bearing? Anyway, they, they, they changed the sensitivity of that instrument, but that was super cheap and that was under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a, a little technical upgrade, but no one had to see that. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they um, they were quiet about it, and they didn't need to spend money by, by chance, or they couldn't have done that, right? They were sneaky. So well, there's always um, a reticence when you are um, approaching your NASA funding agency and saying, I want to do this giant mission that costs a gazillion billion dollars, right? And they're like, oh, we can't possibly afford that. So, uh, you know, like, like John said, it was like a Trojan horse, you know? They put in, it's just going to be this little mission. And then just as exactly as he said, the, the, the idea was don't do anything that would preclude going further. And then once it's a big success, you say, you know what? We're just a little, little bit more than we can do this thing. Okay, let's do Uranus. Okay, and just a little bit more and then we can do this. You know, we're still, we still handle our missions like that today. For example, um, the New Horizons mission. Uh, this is live. This is yeah, live. That's yeah. okay. No, no, no. no this is this is right. this is happening. This is the, real. The, the Pluto mission. The Pluto flyby. Yeah. That's right. Pluto flyby. The New Horizons mission was the mission that you know the complete mission was to Pluto, but it was designed so that you know if everything was successful and they made it past Pluto um, with no problems, there's an opportunity to go by another object further out. And we were able to find, using Hubble Space Telescope, find another object along the trajectory. And so the case was made to NASA saying, hey, 
You know, this was a mighty successful Pluto flyby. Instruments are still working great. There is an object along our trajectory. How about we go yeah. on to do that? But, but if I may honor the, the questioner, by some strange coincidence, there's extra fuel in the tanks. Uh, <laughs> by some strange coincidence, you know, the, there's a extra, you know, uh, juice left in the RPG generator. Uh, I have covered a lot of NASA missions, and it's always been this strange coincidence <laughs> <laughs> that after the main mission is done, the mission for which funding was allocated, uh, someone can always say, well, you know, there's a secondary mission. Um, I consider that good engineering, good. not strange right. coincidences. And, and hydrazine, hydrazine is cheap. Hydrazine yeah, is right. cheap, absolutely. But, not, but not, uh, not beyond the orbit of Mars. You know, if you're going to build a billion dollar spacecraft, don't you think we would want to use it more than once? I would can? hope so. I would hope so. Uh, I'm curious what the scientist's reaction has been to the film, particularly yeah. the more uh, mass commercial appeal aspects of it, like the extraterrestrial life focus and <laughs> talking about the golden record so much, you know, how have scientists hmm. reacted to that? I can tell you how some of my colleagues have reacted. Um, almost, it, it's almost a 50-50 split. Um, half of them say, oh, there wasn't enough science. <laughs> and to which I always respond, this was really, I mean, it is a documentary, but it was, I view it as more of an art film that just happens to be crafted around a scientific enterprise. Um, but there are, um, but other, you know, the other half of my scientific colleagues, um, they, they appreciate, uh, they appreciate how the story was communicated so beautifully in this. And then there are some who still, to this day, a, as you heard, they don't understand the whole golden record thing. You know, it, it wasn't a science thing at all. And why was it, if this was, if this was a science documentary, why was there so much focus on the golden record? <clears throat> to which I answer, it wasn't a science documentary. <laughs> um, it was a story about Voyager, and that's a big piece of the story. So that's okay. my answer. So I, I, I'd agree with that, but I, I'd also say that there is uh, considerable science around the golden record story, and, and that is the whole discussion of what is the likelihood, uh, if there are intelligent beings, what is the likelihood of an encounter? And there's a whole discussion of the vastness of space and mm -hmm. the factor of, 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 of time, right? Um, how long will a civilization last that might pick up this, um, this signal or detect mm -hmm. this craft? So, so there's a considerable discussion of the prospects of discovery there, and that's mm -hmm. a scientific discussion. Yeah, that's true. Sir. First of all, I want to thank all three of you for taking us on an extraordinary journey. And I want to bring the conversation back full circle to your observation about the Carl Sagan effect. Uh, I have a background in vertebrate paleontology, and I remember in graduate school, uh, there was a lot of criticism aimed at Stephen Jay Gould. Mm. And uh, in a way, you can refer to this as the Stephen Jay Gould effect. Mm -hmm. uh, even though Gould got some of his science very, very right and some other aspects very, very wrong, I think that like Sagan, he was one of our most important science communicators. And I tell friends of mine who are, who are writers writing literary fiction that if they want to read great essays, they have to take a look at Gould's work. Uh, to pose this question to Heidi, do you think that your work in science communication has had any negative impact on your career in science? I mean, I, it, it is a valid question. I know I've heard some people have felt that it's, it's trying to strike a 50-50 balance between excellent science communication and excellence towards their research. Thank you. It's difficult for any one individual such as myself to be able to untangle that question. I think in Carl Sagan's case, it was very clear that his science communication had negative impacts on his scientific career. I'm hoping, and, and maybe I'm naive, but I'm hoping that we are changing the climate in science enough so that people, our scientific colleagues, recognize that communication is a valuable aspect to bring to the scientific enterprise. Um, I think all of us do better uh, when we are sharing what we do uh, with the people who fund many of us, what, if it's 
taxpayer-funded work. And also, as I said earlier, um, sharing the stories of what we do as scientists, I think is so valuable to bringing in the next generation of young people. So I, I will say in my case, I don't think that being um, a communicator helped me with my career. I don't think it hindered my career. I think in my case, they were so intertwined that it's, it's really hard for me to separate that. I do see the next generation of young scientists being far more actively engaged in communication. And I'm hoping that they are interacting with the journalists as well, um, so that it isn't just going to the public, but going to people who can amplify the voices of the scientists by getting it into, into broader media. Let me, um, let me just turn that question around and ask you, John, do you think as a filmmaker, deciding to specialize in science topics has hurt your career? Uh, that is interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm just so, it, it, I'm so bound up with doing science films is what I'm known for. So you can't, I, it, I, it's almost hard to make sense of the question because I, I mostly do science film, and, and I think, um, so I, I would think, so it, it, it helps actually, and so when I made the turn from uh, doing, doing science, cognitive science, um, science helped in this sense. The first uh, big film I was given to produce was a film in my arena of cognitive science, and I was able to kind of parlay that expertise, because no one wanted it you know, a, a nobody producer, right? The only reason I was able to do that is because I knew about the field and that was a great stepping stone. That would actually create an opportunity, a niche for you. That, would, niche have, for that you. would never have been offered. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, you know, we, we've had a, a long and glorious uh, uh, voyage together here this evening, uh, both with the, the film and, and those of you online. I, I'm sorry you didn't get to see it, but urge you to uh, take advantage of the PBS screening uh, in November. Um, but in particular, your thoughts about science communication, your place as a, as a, a living character, um, your place as a filmmaker, um, I think you've, you've helped us see that the main character in this documentary was, was all of us. And that's an extraordinary thing. And I thank you for the film and I thank you for sharing what you did in the film. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.